All right, if you have a Bible, uh, turn with me to Joshua chapter 5. We're going to look at uh, verses in chapter 5 and 6 today, and the title is Principles of Spiritual Warfare. So um, we'll just look at, we'll read different verses as I go along in the message. So let me pray for us as we start. He awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to listen like one being taught. The Lord God has opened my ear and I was not disobedient, nor did I turn back. Amen. Well, at this point, Joshua is by Jericho and he encounters the captain of the Lord's host in verse 13. Look at verse 13 of chapter 5. Now it came about when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, a man was standing opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? Now who is this that he, that Joshua encounters? Well, this is a what is called a theophany, an appearance of God in human form. And we see theophanies uh, different times throughout Scripture before God actually took the form of, a, of and became a man, so before the incarnation. Now, this particular theophany is likely the second pers person of the Trinity, or a Christophany. And that would be God the Son in appearance as a man. Look down at verse 15, still in chapter 5. The captain of the Lord's host said to Joshua, Remove your sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Then look at chapter 6 and verse 2. The Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand with its king and the valiant warriors. So this is the Lord, and Joshua worships him, and he accepts his worship. That's one of the ways we know that this is the Lord. Think of Paul in the book of Acts when they tried to worship him and his friends, and he stopped them. He said, you know, stop. We're, we're just mere men like you are, but that's not what happens here. Now Joshua asks him at the end of verse 13, back up in verse 13 of chapter 5, are you for us or for our adversaries? And notice the answer he gets in verse 14. He said, no. Rather, I indeed come now as captain of the host of the Lord. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and bowed down and said to him, What has my Lord to say to his servant? So he falls down and he worships. And he changes his tone from that of inquiry to really just complete surrender. He says, What has my Lord to say to his servant? So why is he there? He says he's the captain of the, of the Lord's host. Well, our natural inclination might be to think that he's telling Joshua basically that he's going to lead his troops into battle, right? That he's going to be or lead the charge. But I think there's more going on here. And that's what... Uh, I'm using to introduce our topic this morning. You see, there's actually two battles going on here. There's an invisible battle, and there's a visible battle. And the outcome of the visible battle depends on what's going on in the invisible. <clears throat> As they move into the land of Canaan, they're going to be engaged in spiritual warfare. 
as well as physical. And that's what you and I are engaged in. Every day as believers, as Christians, that's what's taking place when we come here on Sunday mornings for worship, even if we're not aware of it. Whether someone responds, for example, to God's word has to do with the spiritual realm as well. Spiritual warfare, spiritual battle. Whether or not someone comes to Christ in a saving way. Whether or not God changes our lives. Whether or not we're motivated when we leave this place to go out and speak of Christ. To reach out to people. All of those things are related at some level <clears throat> to spiritual warfare. Spiritual battle that is going on all around us. Well, in this passage, we see some principles of spiritual warfare. And that's what we want to think about together this morning. Principles that we can learn and that we can use in our lives as well. Look at verses 1 and 2 of chapter 6. Now, Jericho was tightly shut, <coughs> shut because of the sons of Israel. No one went out and no one came in. The Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand with its king and the valiant warriors. Well, first, notice the city had been given to them. That's what... Verse 2 says, I have given Jericho into your hand. Yet, as we've been talking about, they still had to go in and take it. It had been given on the one hand, but they had to take it. They still had to acquire it. Here is a spiritual principle, then, in our daily spiritual warfare. As we have seen, Canaan represents heaven. But it also represents what we have in Christ right now. The things that God has promised us, the promises of the Bible, uh, the things that he has promised us in this life as Christians. And like the Israelites, we have to take the land. We have to, or to put it in a, another man's words, possess our possessions. That's what we have to do. And like the Israelites, there's going to be opposition along the way for us to do that. Uh, our opposition comes from the world. It comes from our own fallenness or the flesh. And it also comes from the devil, the world, that non-Christian society out there all around us with a value system that's different and anti-God and it's designed to pull you away from allegiance to God. It's a society that threatens us. John tells us in his study, you'll remember 1 John, that currently the world lies in the lap of the evil one. It is currently, not a, it is currently under control, the world system out there that wants to mold you into its image by the evil one. So there's the world. There's the flesh. That part of you and me that's a traitor. That part of us, that, that sinful nature that we still have, it, it, it keeps trying to trip us up. And then there's the devil and his cohorts. He's a very real person. Peter tells us that he's roaming about like a lion seeking someone to devour. His purposes, his cohort's purposes, are to, again, destruct lives, destroy lives, and use them in his opposition to God. So as we engage, then, in spiritual warfare, principle number one is to understand that the city has been given. God has promised me things that are mine for the taking, if I'll tackle them. And I can do it through his power. Now, if you can, keep your uh, finger in this passage and turn with me to 
2 Corinthians chapter 10 for just a minute. I want to look at the classic passage on spiritual warfare. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. I'm going to read verses 4 and 5. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5. Again, we'll come back to Joshua in just a minute. Paul says this, For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculation. Some translations there will read vain imaginations. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Okay? The mind of man. See, that's what we're... That's what we're after. That's what we want to take. Men have imaginations. They have speculations. Uh, I did for years. Vain imaginations before I became a Christian. Many of the people you work with, many of the people out in the community, they have vain imaginations, speculations. They, for one thing, they imagine that they're okay with God. Right? The average person out there thinks they're okay with God. They imagine that God grades on a curve. Right? But he doesn't. You either make a hundred on the exam or you fail. And if you fail, then or you flunk, you go to hell. That's what the Bible teaches. Romans 6, 23. The wages of sin is death. And death means hell. We want to get to heaven, we have to make a hundred. We want to get there on our own merit. Now, there is a way that imperfect people can get to heaven. But it starts by realizing, first of all, that you're imperfect. Very imperfect. Uh, that we are rebels very rebellious. And then by coming to Jesus Christ, acknowledging what he has done, that he came, he lived a perfect life, fulfilled God's requirements totally, and then he took it a step further. He went to the cross, he died on the cross in your place, in my place, took on himself the punishment that we deserve from God, satisfied his wrath completely, and basically bought heaven for anyone who will come to it in true repentance and true surrender. But see, instead of that, most people erect vain imaginations against that sort of thinking, imagining that they're okay with God the way they are. Verse 5 speaks in our passage in 2 Corinthians of every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. Listen to how the uh, Living Bible paraphrases this verse. I use God's mighty weapons to knock down the devil's strongholds. Those weapons can break down every proud argument against God and every wall that can be built to keep men from finding it. With these weapons, I can capture rebels and bring them back to God. That's what we're engaged in. We're after the minds of men. Well, what are our weapons? Uh, what are the weapons that Joshua and his people used here? Turn back to the Joshua passage. Well, first, notice that they had to encompass the city. They had to encompass the city. Look at chapter 6 and verse 3. You shall march around the city, all the men of war, circling the city once. 
you shall do so for six days. Now, what is that picture for us? As we're thinking about spiritual battle, as we're thinking about spiritual warfare. Well, that pictures our need to encompass the battle that we're in, whatever that is for you at present, whatever you're engaged in. We need to encompass the battle we're engaged in with regular, systematic prayer. Prayer. That's how we encompass our battle. Now, here's an idea. Here's a way we can do that. Make a list. Keep it simple. Make a list of one or two people that you know that you don't know where they are spiritually. And then encompass them with prayer. Begin to pray systematically, regularly for, for them. Surround them with prayer. That's where we should begin any spiritual warfare, right, that we're engaged in. Now, second, notice that they also had to persevere in using the appointed means that they were given. In their case, they were to blow trumpets. Look at verses 4 and 5, still in chapter 6. Also, seven priests shall carry seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark, then on the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. It shall be that when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, <clears throat> all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people will go up every man straight ahead. Now, the trumpets symbolize in the Bible uh, the word of God. The word of God. For example, in Revelation chapter 1, in verse 10, John says, I heard behind me a loud voice like the sound of a trumpet. And then when he turns around to see the voice, he sees it says, one like a son of man, in verse 13 of Revelation 1. Charles Simeon, in a sermon he preached, says this of the trumpets. If the trumpets did not typify, it certainly illustrates the witness which the gospel was to obtain over all the principalities and powers of earth and hell. No human force was used. Nothing but the sound of the gospel trumpet prevailed for the submission of Satan's kingdom. Ain't that encouraging? The power of the gospel. Paul said in Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. The gospel. The gospel. You know, that simple story of our crucified Savior who was the Son of God, who died for you and me, who rose from the dead, who offers salvation as a gift through genuine surrender and real repentance and trust in him to forgive me as a gift. That simple story, see, is like dynamite. It's like a piece of dynamite in the hands of God when you share. The weapons of our warfare are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, Paul says. We need to use the methods. We need to persevere in using the methods that God has given us. We pray. We encompass the situation with prayer, and then we blow the trumpets. We share the gospel. We persevere. Now, thirdly, we claim the victory by faith. We claim the victory by faith. Look at verse 16, chapter 6. At the seventh time, when the priests blew the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. Then look down at 
Verse 20. So the people shouted, and priests blew the trumpets. And when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, the people shouted with a great shout, and the wall fell down flat, so that the people went up into the city, every man straight ahead, and they took the city. It took faith for them to shout. It took faith. Think about it. Suppose you were part of the army marching around the city for six days and nothing happened. You're talking with others in the army. You know the wall is supposed to fall down at some point, but it doesn't seem to be happening. You don't see any cracks in the wall. You don't see any gates that have been left open. Meanwhile, there's the crowd all up along the top of the wall, and they're mocking you every day. And now you're supposed to shout, and this wall is supposed to fall down. It took faith. See, that shout means crack or no crack, open gate or no open gate, I believe that wall's coming down. And so they shouted. They shouted. Uh, listen to what Hannah Smith says here about this. She says, no one can suppose for a moment that this shout caused the walls to fall, and yet the secret of their victory lay just in this shout, for it was the shout of a faith, and I love this, which dared, on the authority of God's word alone to claim a promised victory while as yet there were no signs of this victory being accomplished. And according to their faith, God did unto them, when they shouted, he made the walls fall. They claimed the victory by faith. Okay, now, to be sure... God had promised them that this was going to happen. I'm not propagating name it and claim it theology. I'm not meaning to propagate prosperity theology. But as we have been seeing, there are many things that God has promised us and many resources we've been given as we wage war war against the powers of darkness and evil. So let's ask ourselves, what's your Jericho? What's my Jericho? Or maybe, better question, who is your Jericho? Maybe it's a family member. Someone you've been praying for for years. And they just don't seem to be open to spiritual things. They just don't seem to be open to the gospel. Maybe it's a wayward child. My sister uh, became a Christian about nine months before I did. And I was the, uh, the rebel of the family. And she prayed for me, and someone said to her, try to picture your brother as a Christian. You know, draw a mental image. Try to picture him as having a Bible, reading a Bible, going to a Bible study, you know, adopting God's values in his everyday decision making and thinking it was very hard for her to do that at first. I was her Jericho, and this was her shout. Maybe your Jericho is a work situation. A boss who doesn't value your faith or your approach to doing business or carrying out your job responsibilities. Encompass him. Encompass her with prayer. And then persevere. Continue to look for ways to blow that trumpet, to share the gospel by the way you live, by the way you conduct your job, and also in word. Continue to believe the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. And then picture that person as a believer. 
claim victory over their soul. Shout the shout of faith. Well, <clears throat> as Salem, part of our Jericho is right outside these doors, right? This neighborhood, this community, uh, as well as our own neighborhoods where we live. You know, I know that many of you, like myself, go on walks regularly uh, in the streets, in your neighborhood, and you pass by people's houses as you do that. Encompass them in prayer. Um, I told Robert I was going <clears> to <throat> pick on him this morning. Uh, he, he's my neighbor. And we have a causeway that goes from my side of the, the island over to Treadwell Island where Robert li lives. And I've looked out my window before and I think I've seen Robert marching up and down that causeway blowing trumpets before. Now, not really. But I know that Robert prays. I know he prays for his neighbors. We need to use the means that God has given us. We need to encompass our neighbors in prayer. We need to pray regularly as a church family for this neighborhood, for Alpine and this surrounding area. We need to blow those trumpets and persevere and trust that God will increase our impact in this community, that he'll be at work to give us the victory as we step out in faith. We need to be looking to him for ideas. You know, how can we reach out and be a blessing with the gospel message. The weapons of our warfare, Paul says, are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Let's pray together. As your hearts are bowed, are you, are you engaged? Are you engaged in spiritual warfare? Are you praying for this community? Are you praying for your family, your neighbors? Are you using the weapons that God has given us? Have you gotten into the battle to begin with? See, that's the starting place. Are you part of the Lord's army? That's the first step, to join the right team. How do you do that? Well, you do that by coming to Jesus Christ, by being reconciled to God, because our sin has separated us from him. If you've never truly come to Jesus Christ and joined the Lord's army, you can do it right now. Pray like this in your heart. Lord, I realize that I have been against you and not for you because I've been living my life the way I want to live it. And I've sinned against you. Thank you for dying on the cross for me and for my sin. Come into my heart right now. Make me a part of your army. Make me the kind of person that you want me to be from this day forward. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.